Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in. We are so glad you're here. Um, as you hopefully um, are eating some lunch, getting a snack, that type of thing, we are excited to have you with us. I am going to pass off the mic to Danielle Boudreau from HUCTW um, just to welcome you all here and tell you how glad we're that you're joining us. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. I'm Danielle, as Sarah mentioned, from HUCTW, and I'm very glad to have all of you here. Uh, as many of you might know, this is part of our ongoing partnership with the Harvard University Employees Credit Union to provide financial education to our members. And we're always very grateful to both Sarah and her colleague, Magdalia, who's here for presenting to us. So I know credit is a topic many people want to learn about, and we're glad you're able to be here. So thanks so much for joining us, and I will pass it back to Sarah for our presentation. Thank you, Danielle. And as a proud HUCTW member myself, I'm glad that this service is provided for us um, and is something that we have access to as union members. Um, and Danielle will also be um, monitoring some questions. So if you have questions about the union, um, she's happy to answer those as well. But of course, if you have questions about any of the financial aspect of it, we are happy to answer those. Um, like Danielle said, I am joined by my colleague, Magdalia Gomez, and I'm Sarah Scruggs. We are the Community Engagement Department at Harvard University Employees Credit Union, and we are happy to be here with all of you. Magdalia will be monitoring the chat at the beginning of the webinar, and then she will take over for the second half, and I will be monitoring the chat afterwards. So we are glad to have you here. Just a couple of different things. We've gone ahead and muted everybody on the call. So you can continue um, doing whatever you need to do. Maybe you're working or um, taking your lunch. Do all of those things. That is totally fine. And hopefully this way you can hear us a little bit better. We don't want this to mean that there's no questions or comments throughout. Please use the questions feature. The questions feature should be either on the right side of your screen or at the top navigation. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you test this out with me, number one, to make sure that you can hear me, and number two, to make sure that you know where the questions feature is. If you could put into the questions feature where you are joining us from today, that would be wonderful. So if you could just type that into the questions feature where you're joining us from today, that way I know that you can hear me and I know that you um, know where the questions feature is to ask those good questions. You've got some folks joining us from Longwood over on the Medical School campus, East Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Natick, Brighton, Arlington. Great. Thank you all so much for letting us know. Uh, this is always so helpful. Number one, it's fun to know where people are joining us from, but it's always good to know that you can hear and you know where that questions feature is if questions do come up while you are on the presentation today. Know that the presentation is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel so that you can rewatch. Um, if there's anything that you maybe want to hear again or look at one more time, it will be there and we will send you an email um, probably tomorrow uh, with all of this information included so that that way it's a one-stop shop for you to get the survey link as well as all of the recording information. And we do have a post-workshop survey today. Um, and we actually sit down with this information each year with our colleagues over at HUCTW and just go over what these comments are and how we can improve this going into the next year. Um, in previous years, we had not done a car buying um, presentation and it was extremely well received this year. And we actually got this idea from our surveys. So please know that we are listening to what you have to say in these surveys. And we think these are one of the most important ways that we can continue making these programs a success for our union on campus. To tell you a little bit more about Harvard University Employees Credit Union, something that I wanna point out is in that first community focused side of things, which is that once you're a member of the credit union, you will always remain a member even if you um, decide to find a new position outside of Harvard um, or if you uh, move or move away, you can use us wherever um, because we do have mobile banking and online banking and you can use any of our services outside of Massachusetts. And I want to also point out that when you join, if you become a member of the credit union, 
Membership extends to all of those in your family. So grandparents, parents, children, um, brother, sister. So if other folks in your family do need services that the credit union provides, that is something that they have access to through you um, as a Harvard affiliate. So something that we wanted to point out, and if you have any questions about membership, you are welcome to put those in the questions feature as well, or get in contact with us or our support center afterwards. We will give you that contact information on the last slide. Um, so please know that we're happy to answer any questions about um, the credit union as well. Diving right into our topic today, how credit works. I loved the questions that we got from the registration uh, because there were just, I mean, just so many questions ranging from um, specifics all the way to what even is credit? And um, that was a great question. And I think that person will get a lot out of today's webinar. Um, but starting with the impact, a question that we had from the registration was, so I know that credit impacts my ability to get a mortgage or a car loan, but how else can it impact me? And I want this um, slide to kind of talk a little bit to that. This is for a car loan, yes, but it doesn't just impact your eligibility to get a car loan. It can also impact the annual percentage rate or APR or what we might know as interest rate. Um, and so you see here that these credit scores range from uneligible all the way to the top scores of the, between that 720 and 850, where you see it has the lowest interest rate, the 4.23% interest rate. And so having a high credit score can save you money in the long run. It really can, and it not only impacts loans and things of that nature, these days it's impacting whether folks can get an apartment. Some apartment rental companies will ask you for a credit check. They may ask you for different things. Um, you know, once you apply for a job, I know at my job now, I had to have them check my credit. Obviously, as somebody who's a financial educator, you want to make sure that your credit is in good standing. And so credit can really impact us in many different ways. And I hope that you see this chart and see, you know what, if my credit isn't exactly where I want it to be right now, but I need a loan of some type, that maybe in the future, if I raise my credit score, I may be eligible to refinance on that debt and get that great APR or that lower APR that you're seeing advertised for folks. Um, and I will say that these um, interest rates probably aren't the interest rates for car loans that you're seeing right now. So <laughs> don't be put off by some of these interest rates. Um, luckily, some of them are getting a little bit lower these days. So what is credit? Um, and this, this slide really talks a lot about you know, the basic, what is credit versus what is not credit. Utilizing a loan now, so utilizing money now, and paying it back over a period of time. These are gonna be larger purchases. Um, and I think this is something that's really important. Um, these are things like education. These are investments that you're making um, for something that you need now, but that you're going to be paying for over the long term. This is not something <laughs> in your credit, I mean, in your um, checking account. So that is not your credit. Um, there's no credit in, paying for things with your income-based funds. So those are not credit, um, those things that are happening in your checking or savings account. So there are three major credit bureaus that collect all of our information, and these are based on individual consumers. The three major credit bureaus are Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, um, and they have possibly different information um, from each other. The reason for this is because let's say you're getting a small personal loan um, from a local bank, um, maybe $1,000. They may not report that out to each of the three bureaus, just number one, because of time limitations. They may not have the um, full power to report it to all three of the bureaus because it does take time to do that. Um, and it does cost them money to um, send these this information to all three bureaus. So you may find that each bureau has different information on you. More than likely, they'll have each of them will have all of your really large loans. Um, but anything that's extremely small, maybe you got it from a very local bank, um, then they may not have all that information on you at each bureau. 
all of this information is sent to them by lenders and um, by utility companies, possibly debt collection agencies, courts. Um, so there could be information on there ranging from um, the time you got a car loan when you were, you know, 18 uh, versus maybe being sent to collections recently. So that information lives on your credit report. And all of this information is tied to you by your social security number. So this is all individual consumer. Probably um, if you have applied for a mortgage with a partner or spouse, um, you've had to give both of your credit information because just because we get married or um, you know have a civil union, that does not mean that we have the same credit information. Um, we have different credit information because it is tied to us individually. So what does a credit report show to our lenders? It shows all of these things to them. It shows the debts that we hold, whether that be credit card, auto debt, education debt, mortgages. Um, and it shows all of our accounts that are open in good standing. This is really a great thing um, to have on our account um, and something that I think is really important that we have those great accounts in good standing. Anytime you're sent to collections, that will be on your credit history. Um, and I saw somebody ask a question, how long does negative information remain on your credit report? We're actually going to have a whole slide about that in just a couple um, of moments. So I'm definitely going to answer that question. But um, things like collections do stay on your credit report for quite some time, as well as your payment history. This is one of the largest impacts on your credit score is payment history, whether that is good or bad. Um, and one thing that we just, I mean, I can't say it enough, paying things on time is one of the most important things we can do with our money. Um, and so it will have a complete history of your payments there. It also, you have the ability to request this information um, on your credit report. If you've never looked at your credit report before, I highly recommend doing so at annualcreditreport.com. Annualcreditreport.com is the only source on the internet to provide you with your federal, federally authorized credit report. And so this is a great source. Something to point out, it doesn't have free in the name. Okay. Um, there are many other places for you to get a correct credit report. But this is the only source that is authorized by federal law to do so. Something that I want to point out, it is label this annual credit report during COVID until April of 2022. Um, you can actually get your credit report for free weekly from annualcreditreport.com. Do I think it's necessary to check your credit report every week? Probably not. Um, you're not going to see much change from week to week, but something that I personally recommend about three to four months is a good cadence to check in on that credit report about every three to four months. And this is a soft pull of your credit report because it is um, educational purposes only. This will not harm your credit score at all. You will not see a dip in your credit score by checking your credit report once every three to four months. This is just a service to you so that you can be educated on these things. So we wanted to show you a sample of what a credit report looks like for a lender. This is kind of what lenders are seeing when they check your credit. If you've applied for a loan, these are the things they're seeing. This is obviously on our credit card. This is specific information about the Harvard University Employees Credit Card that we see here. And you'll see here the payment history, all these C's, that means that they've paid that. They're current. That's what the C stands for here, is that it's current. Um, and it, it gives us a lot of good information. And some things that I want to point to um, that are extremely important. We see here that the credit limit is $5,500 on this particular card. The next thing my eyes go to is that high balance. The high balance isn't necessarily what is on their card right now or what they haven't paid back. 
this is just what they spent in one month at one point in time. That high balance is very close to that credit limit. So why is this important? Well, when we think about lending money to someone, when a lender sees that this high balance is really close to that credit limit, this could mean a couple of things. It could mean that somebody just needed to buy, buy something that was a lot of money that month. <laughs> that, that could simply be it. It could also mean that this person isn't able to put things on their own bank account card or write a check for it because they may not have that money right now to be able to spend on it. And this could be a bad thing. It could mean that this person isn't able to pay back that high balance. That's quite a bit of money to spend in one month. Um, and so that could send a signal of they're not able to pay that back um, on time. But you'll see here too that they haven't been delinquent. So they've paid these things on time. That's a good thing. And we see that the current balance is still quite high as well based on their credit limit. And McDowell is gonna give you some more information about how this affects a credit score. But these are just things that would point to a lender maybe saying, oh, you know, I don't know if we should up their credit limit at all because they're spending a good amount of that. I don't want them to overspend. So this is all really good information for lenders to see. It gives us a good picture of, um, the type of accounts that you have open, how much you're spending, your spending habits, those types of things. But the good news here is that this, this person, this individual is not delinquent on her account. They're current, that's great. Now we have a different lender view. This is specifically on collection agencies. You'll see here that this, says collection agencies here. And then you'll see Comcast. Comcast is a utility company. They provide cable, internet services. So why is this on their credit report? It is because it was sent to collection, you see there, and they are past due. There's a derogatory account here, and they are past due on $310. They are not only past due, they are seriously past due. So that means what happened, what a lot of folks sometimes will, will do, um, unfortunately, is if you live with roommates um, and you maybe move out of the apartment before they do uh, and they don't pay that final Comcast bill you think you did, but you didn't end up paying that final bill, now it stays on your account and you may not even know it. That is actually what happened with this um, person. And then they paid off that $310. And so that was good, they paid it off, but this was still on their account because it was sent to a collection agency. So this unfortunately isn't good news um, to have a collection on your account. You definitely don't want that. Um, being sent to collections is something that stays on your credit report. So you want to make sure that you're doing everything that you can to stay up to date on all of your bills. Like that question asked, how long do these things stay on your credit report? This is a good, um, as of 2017, okay, so as of 2017, these were the numbers for those types of things. So credit inquiries, so let's say you apply for a credit card. Um, Two years later, it will roll off of your account that you inquired about that credit card if you don't open an account. But two years can stay on there for some time. And then from two years, it goes all the way up to seven years on things like missed payments, bankruptcy, collections. Those things can stay on for up to seven years. Um, so it's something to think about, um, making sure you make those payments on time making sure that you are doing all you can to um, make those payments in a timely fashion, not get sent to collections. Accounts in good standing, open accounts in good standing, stay on there indefinitely until you close them and then they stay on there for 10 years. So um, recently someone closed in um, an auto loan. Let's say they paid it off all their payments were on time. This will stay on their account for 10 more years. 
and that's a good thing. It shows, hey, I borrowed money, I paid it all back. That's great, wonderful. <laughs> so it's important to know that um, these are things that are staying on your account for quite some time. So we wanna do everything we can to pay on time. Let's say that you have recently read through your credit report and you find that there's an error on there. There is something that you did not apply for or maybe you paid on time, but it says that it was a late payment. What can you do? The first thing that I encourage you to do is contact the lender of the um, error on there. So I really think it's important to contact them and say, hi, I've rec recorded all my payments. I have um, the backup. I can show you those receipts of when I did pay. And more than likely, they'll be able to work with you to make sure that that error is reversed. You may have to contact the credit bureau directly. The dispute has to be in writing and the bureau must then begin the investigation within 30 days to get that error reversed on your credit report. And you can find sample letters on the consumer.ftc.gov if you do find an error and need to contact the credit bureau. And then the last thing on this slide I think is really important is following up. A lot of times this will take them more than 30 days to investigate. So you may need to follow up multiple times and just say, hey, I'm checking in. I wanna know, um, you know, has this been removed from my credit report? And check in on your credit report to make sure that the thing is removed that needs to be removed. Um, but make sure that you check in if there's something that you haven't heard from in a while or you need to make sure that that thing has been removed from your credit report. So what do you do if your information is compromised? This might mean um, that there's an error on your credit report that somebody has um, you know, gotten this information, maybe somebody has gotten your social security number, maybe somebody has applied for a loan on your behalf when you didn't apply for that loan. What should you do? There are two different steps you can take, one being a fraud alert. This is this notifies any lender that you need to go through extra steps to verify your identity before it gives you any loan amount. So they may try to contact you. If you apply for a loan, you may have to go through additional steps. Um, but this is something that can, um, you know, if you think somebody might have your information, this is a great first step to take. It does last one year on your account and you can still receive loans and credit lines if you have a fraud alert set up. They just have to go through additional steps. You need to contact each of the credit bureaus to have them place the alert on your account. The way that you do this is just online. You can look up fraud alert Experian or fraud alert um, TransUnion and you can set that up for yourself. It doesn't cost any money to do this, but you will have to go through extra steps if you do decide to get a loan or a credit line. And a credit freeze, this totally restricts access to your credit report. So this is for folks who know that their information has been compromised and they will not be able to open new accounts in your name unless they have a PIN number that is given to you um, that you set up. Okay, so this PIN number is the only way that you can apply for credit um, and that's when it will be lifted. So this lasts until you ask for it to be lifted. It will stay on your account, whereas a, cred uh, a fraud alert stays on just for a year. A credit freeze stays on until you turn it off. Um, and so really a fraud alert if, is what you wanna go with if you're just suspecting that somebody may have your information. Whereas with a credit freeze, this is what you wanna go with if you know somebody has your information and you wanna keep your um, credit lines safe. I'm gonna turn it over to Magdalia to speak a little bit more about managing a credit score. I and mean, she's gonna talk about all things credit score. There were a ton of questions about credit scores and credit cards, and that is what her section will be covering. So I'm looking forward to all the good information that she's going to share. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everyone. We've had a lot of good questions that are coming in through the chat and the questions panel, so do continue to have those coming in. So really, what exactly 
is the credit score. So we're going to really start there. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what a credit score is. I'd like to think of the credit report that Sarah just walked us through as essentially a transcript, either a college transcript, a high school transcript. It's a collection of information. Then your credit score is pretty much the GPA. It's the number that summarizes the information on that credit report. But to make things a little bit sometimes trickier is it's independently managed. So it's not as if your credit score is being generated by the lenders. They have two different entities, one being FICO score and one being Vantage score that is that are taking information from your credit report to determine your credit score. Uh, one of the common questions that we get is, well, what is the best credit score? What I have a X credit score, is this good or is this bad? I always like to tell folks, do you need credit at this moment or in the near future? If you have a credit score of 600 and aren't in need of credit, that's okay, because you can work on it to bring it up. Um, if you need it at that moment, then at that moment, having that credit score will not be as favorable. As Sarah showed in the beginning, having a higher credit score is going to be more favorable when you are in need of credit. It also, however, can impact insurance and can impact, uh, specifically not in Massachusetts, but in other states. So depending on which state you live, it, it could impact the cost of some products that are not necessarily tied to getting a loan could impact your ability to get an apartment, a, a home, et cetera. But ultimately having the higher credit score will be better. There are different ranges of credit score. The, the one that's the most common is usually the 300 to 850. Uh, there are some credit scores that only go up to 800. But I think for the most part, if the higher your credit score, the better you will be at the moment that you will need credit. Someone asked, does zip code determine your credit score? It really, that's a, a sort of a loaded question, if you will. It depends. It's not directly going to impact your credit score, but there are certain areas that just based off of income and their ability to repay, they may be able to have a higher credit score versus some other. So it's not that the zip code is impacting. It's more tied to the social economics of that the, the zip code that you may be living in. Uh, so it's very common that you may see reports of, oh, people in this zip, in your zip code have XYZ credit score. Again, it's not the zip code. It's similar to health. It's similar to school district. It just sometimes depends on the financial capabilities of those that live in that specific region. But the zip code itself will not directly impact your credit score. So they had a lot of questions that came in. So I'm gonna take a moment to walk us through what exactly goes into your score. And this example is of a FICO score. There are different ones. Like I mentioned, there's also the Vantage score. Uh, but for this one, it's the FICO score. I also wanna point out, even though this is a model, it's provided by FICO, it does not mean that it's 100% going to apply to you in every situation. So for example, if you have a credit score of X and your, you miss a payment, that doesn't mean that your credit score is going to drop by 35% right away. It could maybe drop by 10%, 5%, 30 the, 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 um, the percentages you see here are more or less on average, but it's not always going to be like that 100%. There are a lot of different factors that impact it, but this is given for general information. Now, the biggest one here is the payment history. This when I think of FICO score or just credit in general, I think sometimes we overthink it and we're like, oh, what are they doing? So let's all take a step back and let's just think, if you had to lend money to someone that you've never lended money to, lent money to, let's say between Sarah and myself, uh, you know, very little about us other than what Sarah mentioned at the beginning. And, you know, hopefully we do have some of our, of our friends on the webinar, so you may know a little bit more about us. But let's say you have to decide who to lend money to and you know that, Sarah pays all her bills, every monthly payment, credit card, she does it on time. And I instead pay two to three weeks late. Sometimes I don't pay at all. I do, you know, I'm busy, I forget. How many of you would want to lend to me? You know, feel free to put it in the chat versus lending to Sarah. Sarah, most folks, I see, I see some people saying, yeah, lend to Sarah, yep. So most people are going to tend to choose to lend to the person that is paying on time. So that's a big indicator of your credit score. 
35% of that credit score, and specifically here FICO, but Vantage again being very similar, is based off of simply just paying on time. We will get the questions, well, I'm already paying on time. If I keep paying, is that going to increase my score? Is that going to be better? Not necessarily. And I let's now take a step and not think about FICO score, but let's think about our health. If we are already drinking water every day and we're getting however much water we need or we're already eating healthy and we continue to do so, it's not necessarily going to make us healthier. It's just going to keep us healthy. It's very similar with your credit score. If you're already doing things that are that are putting you in a spot to have a good credit score, continuing to do so will help you, but it's not necessarily going to increase your credit score, not on its own. But if you're an individual that has been making late credit card payments, late utility payments that are then reported to collection, and then you start making payments on time, that is going to help bring up your credit score because you are taking something that wasn't as favorable and you're making improvement towards that action. The other part that really impacts your credit score is going to be the amount owed. And in seeing a lot of questions about this, and I have a couple more that I, I know people submitted, so I'm going to go through all of these and then I will get to questions at the end, just because a lot of the questions that are being submitted, I am going to cover through this section. So um, do feel free to continue those questions. Just know that I'm going to check at the end, since there's a lot that I will cover here that will typically answer most of the questions that we're receiving. Now, amounts owed means if I have a credit limit of $1,000, and for this example, I'm just saying one credit card. If I have a credit card, it's a credit card limit of $1,000, but I owe $900 on that credit card, that's going to negatively impact my credit score because I'm over that 30% limit, excuse me, that, th that recommended 30% of credit card limit, which would be $300. Now, if I instead owed $200 or owed $100, or owed zero, you don't have to owe money. That's a really big piece. You can use credit and you can pay it off in full every month. That is more beneficial for you because you're not paying interest and it does not impact your credit score negatively. It's a, it's a great thing if you're able to use the credit. It's ideal, that's where we really want to be. We want to be able to use the credit, pay it back in full every month and not have to carry a balance. But even if you are paying in full in month every, even if you are paying it in full every month, it is still more beneficial for you to keep it to that 30% or less of the credit limit. Sarah showed an example a couple slides ago of that sample credit report. And on that sample credit report, you could not tell if that individual paid their credit card in full every month or not. You could tell that they paid and you could tell what their minimum payment was, but you cannot tell what that if that individual paid it off in full. Additionally, even if you paid it in full last month, there's no guarantee you're going to do that again in the future month. The only piece that we know is that your minimum payment is X and yes, you've paid it off in the past. So even if you do have a credit, you know, even if you're paying off your credit card in full, but you're charging 900 on that credit limit of 1000, it is more favorable for you to charge 300 or less every month. If you are in a situation that you are carrying, you know, you're, every month you're charging 900, then don't wait until the end of the month. Uh, in general, it's just good for budgeting. Try to pay your credit card every week or you know more more frequently than monthly. You don't know when the credit bureaus are going to report your information, so we don't know when they're going to report that balance. And it's also helpful for money management. If I am, which I hope all of us are on a budget, we're trying to watch our spending and work towards our financial goals. If I build it in my budget to pay off my credit card more often, that will hopefully help me not have to carry a balance. As you see, the 35% for the payment history and 30% of amounts owed, that's really the bulk of your, your score. The other components are important. However, if you are carrying a balance over 30% of your credit limit, and then in addition of the aggregate amount that you have available to you, then those are areas that you can work on to try to break up your score. Length of credit history. This one, a little bit self-explanatory, um, so I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but the longer you have credit, and you know, I eat the better credit that you have, the longer you have good credit, um, the better that's going to be on your credit score. Now, if you have a very long credit history, but it's not favorable, that's not gonna really help you with your credit score. Um, yes, it helps with the length that you've had it for 20 years, but you know, for 20 years, you haven't paid your credit on time, that's not really going to be that helpful. But the longer you have credit history, good credit history, the more favorable that's going to be. New credit indicates 
anytime you apply for a new line of credit, anytime there's a new inquiry, and this is a hard inquiry, it is when you're applying for money. If you are checking your credit score, just so that you know what that is, that is not a net, that's a soft inquiry that will not impact your credit score. So if you do go to annual credit report, which I hope everyone does, definitely one of those things to add to your list. I'm hoping you're all taking notes and thinking of takeaways. If not, this is a good one to add is pull your credit report. Go to annualcreditreport.com and get to see what is on your credit report. It's, it's really empowering. You want to be in a position that you know what's your finances, especially if you're going to be borrowing in the future. You don't want the first time that you find out what's on your credit report to be when a lender is looking at it. And a couple of other questions um, that we usually will get is, well, what happens if I close my account? Well, it, it depends. I have closed plenty of accounts and I have a very, very high credit score. I, however, have had a lot of different types of debt. So my credit file is thicker than other individuals. But if I only had two credit cards, let's say one that I had 20 years ago and one that I opened 20 days ago, if I close that account that I had 20 years, I'm losing all of that history. Now, that's going to have much more of an impact on my credit report versus if I had a card that I opened 20 years ago, another one that I had 15 years ago, another one 10 years ago, I also had this other account because then the average length of credit history is going is not going to be as impacted. Um, I'm getting a, a, couple, a lot of good questions in the, the question through questions. I will say we are going to offer you a resource. We're not going to speak to the specifics of your situation. Um, it's, we, there's just so many questions and we, so we're gonna keep everything very general, but we do have a resource. And Sarah, if you don't mind just dropping the Green Path resource now in the chat, where if you want free credit counseling, um, and if you can't, I can do it later. Uh, but if you do want free credit counseling, if you want someone to review your credit report, you can do it through a resource that we have, a partner of ours. But unfortunately, we're just not going to be able to get into the specifics for a couple of reasons. One, we don't know your situation. We don't know what your credit report is. And we also are not accredited credit counselors. So even though Sarah and I are extremely knowledgeable and can speak to general credit information, everyone's credit situation will be different. It's money is personal money. What works for Sarah may not work for me. Uh, so we do recommend that you speak to professionals and that is a free service that we pay for. So it's available to you. The other piece that goes into is your credit mix. And the credit mix essentially means, well, there are two different categories of credit. You have installment loans, which a little bit, of, you know, it, it's most of the loans that you think of, a car loan, a student loan. It's a loan that has to be paid off in installments. So you pay off a certain amount every month for a certain term or set of months. Then you have a revolving credit, which means I have a credit card and maybe one month I owe $0, next month I may owe $5,000. Sort of depends, month to month, things can change. 10% is based off of that, but that does not mean that you should go and get new credit if you don't need it. And you don't need to have both to have a good credit score. If you do everything else and have everything else, that's gonna help you have a good credit score. So there were a lot of good questions. Um, and Sarah, uh, before we go on to that one, there were, um, I would like to keep it there just because there are a couple of other questions that came up. Um, one of them that was submitted through registration was, do I need a credit card if my credit is good otherwise? That speaks to credit mix and you don't. If you already have a good credit score, there's no need. We don't want you to have to borrow more. Um, that's just one other piece to keep track of. Uh, so you don't need to do that. Uh, will paying cre off credit cards cause my credit score to plateau? No, nope, not at all. It is good. It's ideal. It's better for you to pay it off. You're not carrying a balance. You do have to use your credit card. So that's the thing. You don't want to stop using it all together. But if you have a subscription or, you know, monthly expenses, like if you have a car and you're getting gas or if you when you go food shopping, use the credit card for those expenses. Using a credit card is actually you have more coverage, fraud protection versus using a debit card. However, it is a tool. And I always like to say, if you don't have the money in the, in the checking account, don't use the credit card if you can, you know, as much as you can. We know life happens, but that way you're not tempted to spend more. And then someone did ask, is it okay to close credit cards? Uh, it again, let's this is when I would say speak to a credit an accredited credit counselor. 
through Green Path because everyone's situation is different. But uh, overall, for most people, I will speak for myself, it doesn't impact it that much if you have a good credit file. Uh, and someone did ask, if you close your credit card, will you lose that credit history with that card? Yes, uh, essentially it no longer impacts the score. Um, it'll still show on your credit report, but it won't impact the score as much, which is why if you only have that one old credit card, you may not want to close it. Um, a couple of other questions that came in, is your credit report the same thing as Credit Karma? So Credit Karma can, off, can give you pieces of your credit report, but it's any different apps um, we offer. That's something that we offer too. If any of you are members, I encourage you go on to online banking and you can actually have your FICO score added. Um, and that is something that you can do on our through online banking. You could add the FICO score widget and you'll get information about your credit score. You can get information, but it's not the same. It's always best to go straight to the source and pull your credit report through annualcreditreport.com because anything that a lender or a credit karma is giving you, they're taking it from the source. So why not go straight to the source and get the information? And you're actually gonna get more because you're gonna get everything versus the apps or the online uh, uh, through mobile banking. They're just giving you certain pieces of it. Um, a couple of other folks had questions about the closing date. Um, really, it's a general 30% of the balance. You don't know when they're going to be reporting. So we always recommend just to try to do that 30%. Uh, checking your credit report does not harm your credit score. Uh, that question came in, again, does not. As long as you're the one doing it, if a, if a lender does it because you're seeking credit, that is when it will negatively impact. But if you're shopping around for a product, which we always recommend, try to do it within a two week period. That way it will only count as one inquiry because you're shopping for that specific product. Meaning if I'm looking for a mortgage, I may choose to apply for mortgages or a credit card, whatever product that may be, student loan, I may apply to three or four different lenders during that period to see what my, my rate would be. But try if I do it within a two-week period, if I do four applications for the same product, it will count as one inquiry. It won't have as much of an impact versus if I do it once a month for four months, that would be four inquiries. Okay, um, a couple of questions about uh, bankruptcy and how what impact that could have on the credit score. Um, that's another one that I would recommend contacting Green Path because they can go into much more detail. A question about student loans and do student loans impact credit score? They do because it's at all of this impacts all of the everything you see here, your payment history with that student loan, the amounts owed, how long you've had credit history. For some of us, if we've had loans as an undergrad, that impacts us, especially if you're still paying off and it's been 10, 15, however many years. Now you have all that length of credit history and especially if you're paying on time, that can help you have a good credit score. Um, at the beginning of when you go into repayment, depending on how much you owe, it could negatively impact you if the amount owed are, is significant and you haven't really paid off the balance. But the good thing is that as you continue paying off, and, and these are for, it doesn't matter if it's student, undergrad or grad loans, it's the same concept. Um, it's, a, it's a loan that you're paying, so it, it still will impact it. But it does impact your score because it's part of the credit mix. You are applying for it because it's a new loan. So whether you have that as an undergrad or a grad, it's still the same category. Uh, a question that came in, and then I'm gonna keep going because I know we have a good amount of other content, but does refinancing a loan negatively impact your credit score? It can, but then it can bring it up. It can negatively impact it because now you're inquiring, so you're seeking new credit, but that loan is now being paid off, so that amount owed is gonna disappear from one, but it could, if you're refinancing because now you are getting a better interest rate and more of your payments are going to go towards principal, in the longer term, it can help bring up your score. So it could, uh, but it, uh, it it won't be instantaneously. And another question, does paying early impact your credit score negatively? It doesn't, it's actually better. It's better financially as well. Um, and then there's also the Vantage score. I won't get into too much detail here, but essentially with the Vantage score, it's very similar to, to FICO. Most influential is going to be your payment history. 
and then the type of account, um, which is the credit mix that we spoke about, and then also the percent of credit limit used. Here's a couple of different sample credit reports and just wanna point out a couple of things. Here, when you're looking at your credit score, see what type of score model they're using. Here it's a FICO score eight. Why does that matter? Because if you're looking at a FICO score for TransUnion, let's say, I could be looking as a lender, I could be looking at a FICO experience score. Um, all of these are experienced, but you would see it when you pull your credit score. So it's, it doesn't mean that you're going to have the same credit score with all of the bureaus. I could have a 800 with TransUnion, but a 790 with Equifax. So there are three different credit bureaus. Remember the Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, three credit bureaus, and two companies that give you credit scores. So I could have transun I have a TransUnion Vantage and a TransUnion FICO. So those two are going to most likely be different. Just like when you go to Bing versus Google, your results will just be different. Uh, Pepsi tastes different than Coke. Uh, Burger King is different than McDonald's. So it's you know same differences. They may be similar, but there are a lot of differences. And that means that your score will not be the same across the board, but usually they are within the same range. Now, here you can tell it's a FICO score eight. I I have a 488 in this example, and there are going to be descriptors that are going to tell you why that score is. Here, delinquency is a big one. Ratio of balance to limit on the on the count is too high, meaning more than 30% is owed. Now, as your score increases, as you'll see in the next one, it's the the score descriptors are still important. Uh, a direct derogatory public record or collection file, that's obviously going to be a point, important. But then as you'll see on the next one, you have a higher score. Some things, they're always going to say something you're, and it's not going to be great job. So in this case, time since most recent account opening is too short. Does that mean I should go and open a new account? No, not at all. This is a good score. Yes, there are a couple little things you could do, but that doesn't mean lack of recent installment information. Like, no, do I need to go out and get a new loan? No, you have a good score, there's no need. They're always going to say something. There are some general options. Uh, we did put in the green path information already. This one, it really is personal. Depending on your situation, if you don't have credit and you're trying to get credit, some lenders may give you an unsecured credit card, excuse me, a secured credit card, which means Let's say you put $500 in a, a savings account. They may give you a $500 credit limit, but if you don't pay that credit card, they have access to that $500. So it's secured by your funds. For most people, you have an unsecured credit card, meaning that if you don't pay, yes, it goes onto your credit report, but they don't take away your money. They don't go into one of your accounts. So that's the difference between secured versus unsecured. And then there are different loans uh, that can help you build credit. The biggest piece, if you're not able to get credit, I would recommend contacting GreenPath and also come into one of our branches or give us a call. We do a lot to help our members. We've had members that, especially our international population that may not qualify for a credit card but we with other lenders, but because we are Harvard and we work with our, our community, we do lend to international members and our international population and, and you know even with our students we help them build credit so if you do need to build credit and don't know where to go I encourage you to give us a call or look on our website and i'm going to talk very briefly about choosing a credit card so if you do need to choose a credit card what do you look for a lot of times people look into the rewards which are you know that's nice or the the benefits of the card which is good but they're there, it's more than that. You really want to look at what is the rate that you're going to be charged for carrying a balance. Anytime you apply for a credit card, they have to disclose this information. So between this page and the next one, you'll see the, the rates and the charges and they'll see the fees that they, they will charge you. And you can actually take this information and compare it. And it's the same look, it's the same chart. You can compare it across multiple credit cards. That way you have a better understanding of what exactly is the cost of that card. Fees are a big one. Um, if you're going to be traveling internationally, maybe you don't, you know, maybe avoid a credit card, excuse me, maybe you want to choose a credit card that doesn't have international fees. Um, a, a question that came in 
there's a hundred point difference between two of my credit scores. I would, that's a great one. I would call Green Path and they can pull up your credit reports or they can give you some more information. Something else you could do on your own is you can look at your credit report from each of the bureau because not all of the information will be on all of the credit reports. So if you maybe borrowed a credit, borrowed a loan, let's say a car loan, uh, you took out a car loan, that might just have been reported to two of the bureaus. The third bureau may not have that. And if that is a really good account history, that may not be helping you with that other credit bureau. So just because a lender reports to a bureau doesn't mean that they'll report to all three, which is why you often will see discrepancies. But the best thing is if you're not quite sure why your credit scores are different, especially if it's a significant 100 point difference, that's a big one. I would start by look, pulling all of the credit reports. As Sarah mentioned, you can pull your credit reports at annualcreditreport.com. It is free, it does not impact your credit score and compare what's on them and see because that can help you understand why the biggest why the big difference typically you won't see a big difference between vantage and fico especially not that much if you do want to opt out of credit card offers you can go to optoutprescreen.com keep in mind though if you do this you won't get credit card offers or other product offers so if you are in the market for a credit card that just means you'll have to do some research on your own and we spoke a lot about Green Path, and I, I, you know, I hope folks aren't uh, upset that I'm keep referring you there, and we can't go into more details with your specific information. But you know, Sarah and I, we want you to have the best financial counseling available to you. So we did a lot of work to choose Green Path, and we usually talk to them or meet with them about almost once a week. Uh, actually, I actually have a meeting with them tomorrow. And we know them, they're good people, and they do a lot to train their staff. They're accredited credit counselors. They'll pull up your credit report, specifically the TransUnion. They'll walk through it with you. They'll give you different scenarios. And if you want to go back and talk to them again, you'll have that counselor's information. So you can talk to them as many times as you'd like. Uh, we have hundreds of members that will contact Green Path on a monthly basis. So we encourage you to do the same. And then we have our blog. We had a lot of good questions that came up about credit report, credit scores. Uh, going to our blog, either myself or Sarah will put that in the chat so that you have it. You can also click the, the tag on the right-hand side for credit. So if you want credit-specific information, a lot of questions. Uh, we try to cover most of the questions that came in, but if there's something else, the blog is a really good starting point. Um, and Green Path is available to members, but we do allow those that attend these sessions to contact Green Path, uh, but it is a benefit that we usually recommend for our members. But of course, if you attend one of our sessions, you are, we, we, count, we consider you a part of our community so you can have access to Green Path as well. And for those that are in the market for a new credit card, just wanted to give you some general information about our new one, which is the Plan and Rewards Plus. Um, the information is here, it's also on our website, uh, but essentially, no annual fee, no cash advance fee, and then you'll get 1.5 cash back on all of the different purchases. And if you do have to do a balance transfer, it is 0% for the first 12 months. I will say if you are doing a balance transfer with either us or anyone else, do the math of how much you need to pay monthly so that you can pay off your balance in full before that 0% is over. Because with any balance transfer, after that introductory period, or in this case, the first 12 months, then you will be charged the interest rate that you qualified for or what what that APR is at that point. Uh, so we want to make sure that if you are doing a balance transfer in the hopes of saving money, you calculate how much you need to pay monthly and you're able to stick to that so that you can pay that off in full and take advantage of that 0%. We talked about a lot of different information, but as I mentioned, you know, send, sending over to Green Path and keeping in mind that you know, as much as we gave information, it's general information, it can't be specific to your situation. But if you do have very specific questions, know that this is not tax, legal, or investment advice, so we do recommend that you contact a, a professional such as Green Path. And there was a lot of information that we covered. Um, I just wanna remind you, you know, as the Credit Union for Harvard, we are here to help you. Um, you're all eligible to be members. If you have any questions, even if you're not a member, you're welcome to come into our branch branches. Um, our Harvard Square branch is open right now. School of Public Health, as we know, is closed, so we're not there at the moment. Well, I should say, there, we're not, uh, 
it's close for us. Like we're not able to have our branch there, but we will hopefully in the near future. So if, but if you do have any questions um, and you're more than welcome to contact us and same for your family. And as Sarah mentioned, once you're a member, anyone in your immediate household is also eligible and act more than your household. So grandparents, children, siblings. So if they're interested in anything that we discuss, you are more than welcome to contact have them contact us as well. And we I forgot to put the slide in here, so apologies, but if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to just do that survey to let us know what we could do better, what other topics you'd like for us to cover. And even if it's a topic that maybe we cannot cover in a presentation, we would love to do it in a in a excuse me, in a blog article. And I also want to extend an invitation for everyone that's on for our town hall. If you want to hear directly from the president, our president and CEO, Craig Leonard, we're doing a town hall this Friday from 12 to 1230, in which he just answers your questions. So very similar to what Sarah and I did that we went through your questions, but you're getting the questions from our president and CEO, who used to be our, our C CFO, so really knows his stuff. Uh, but if you wanted to know just some general things about the credit union, you're welcome to register for that at hgcu.org slash workshop. Uh, I think it's hgcu.org slash workshop. You can get to it. Uh, but if not, actually, if you just go to our main page, hgcu.org, it is there. It's one of the, uh, it's right on the main website. So you can get information. If you do have additional questions, please feel free to submit them. Danielle, if there's anything that you'd like to say, you're more than welcome. Um, I did see a question that came in. If you transfer a balance, will a credit card company cancel your card? It depends. You could cancel it. Typically, it's not recommended right away because it can negatively impact your credit score, especially if you don't have the credit history to support it. But I would recommend, that's a great one for Green Path. And Green Path, I should also say, they're they're open till 10 p.m. on some days. They're open Saturdays. And literally, it's a, I've called them myself. We've called them. It's a great call. It's really simple. They'll email you afterwards. So it's, you know, if you have even 10, 15 minutes, just giving them a call, they can give you more specific information as to whether or not it's, it makes sense for you to cancel that card or just do the regular balance transfer.